All stations and systems, we can confirm we are in entry minus 20 minutes. EDL NAV 2 has been initiated. The star tracker has been powered off. That, um, the NAV 2 software has been initi initiated. So when we're in cruise, we use a star tracker in a similar manner to how um, sailors navigated years ago. We look at the stars and get our relative position from them. We use a star tracker for that. And now that we're close enough to Mars, we don't need that anymore. So we're going to transition to what's called NAV2 software. And that lets us basically just uh, use velocity and acceleration from this point on. So we don't need the star tracker anymore. Um, uh, Mark, I'll clarify, slew to inertial or started bent pipe? Slew to appropriate attitude for bent pipe. Bent pipe mode will be Fantastic. entered shortly. Okay, thank you very much. And that was obviously our confirmation of the slew for Marco, so that's great news. Fantastic. Um, so I was saying before that the, uh, the NAV2 software will propagate from here on out and we'll use velocity and acceleration so we have powered off our star tracker and we're on our now two software and everything's looking great okay thanks thanks julie thanks all right the cruise stage separation is just about four minutes away and rob manning joins us now rob is the chief engineer here at jpl and an absolute veteran of mars landings we're going to play a little video for you right now you haven't seen it yet but we'll roll it Go ahead. This no is Lander I show live. 14 reports, carrier lock, get that day, Rob. There you are. You were the phase lead. You were sitting up front. <laughs> yeah. That's why it looked like it when it's successful. Yes. <laughs> I hate to see what it would be like if I wasn't successful. <laughs> But talk about that. What is EDL like? Why is it so hard? Well, it, it's many years of work by many, many people who struggle to put all the pieces together, and particularly because we can't really test entry, descent, and landing on this planet. It's much more complicated. Um, Mars has a lower atmosphere, thick, thinner atmosphere, less Speaking gravity. Marco you Tom. just can't put the pieces. So imagine you had a big Broadway production, Marco B. but you couldn't really do Marco the Alpha show Alpha. until all the audience shows up. So that's what it feels like. So, it's, so you never really know if you've really done it right. Well, we've done it seven times. Can we say that, hey, piece of cake, we know what we're doing? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, it, 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 we get better at it. And there's no doubt. We've learned. We've learned for both the successes and our own failures, including uh, failures of other missions outside of this country. So those pieces come together in our mind's eye. We try to put the, what we learn together and, and just do the best we can. And, and if we don't succeed, we will learn because we are collecting data on the way down. If, we, if something bad happens today, we'll be able to take what we learned. Even though we may fall on the ground after getting kicked off the horse, we'll get back up, brush ourselves off, figure out what we did wrong, and get back on the horse. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty. Just very quickly, give us some possible scenarios of what could happen during EDL <sighs> today, especially during communications. Uh, well, the, the, the great news about having communications, I, there's almost uh, almost anything that go wrong, we, there's a very good chance we'll figure it out. But things like, you know, the parachute has to go right. We know you don't open parachutes on Earth going Mach one and a half, uh, one and a half times the speed of sound. You just don't do that. You don't need to on this planet. But we have to because if we waited any longer, we'd be on the ground. The very complicated radar system has to work from outer space all the way to the ground and look for, look for the ground. What if it locked up on the heat shield? Well, we've tried to avoid that problem. We've fixed that problem, we think, uh, to, uh, to prevent that from happening. But what if we got it wrong? Things like that could, could happen, and our vehicle could have things bad happen. Yeah, but right. but we worked time. hard to prevent them. So At this time, we expect we're getting that close. We're go recording to the control room for cruise stage separation, Rob. Okay. Thank you, Emeril.
Open Slash Systems, EDL Comma. Go ahead. On Inside Court. At this time, MRO has, will have loaded their electro sequences. Uh, Marco is expecting carrier lock uh, at any time. Marco B is reported there in bent pipe. Um, still waiting on A. Copy that. Thank you. Radio Science Report, UHF carrier detected. EDL con, Marco Bravo, Marco Alpha is in bent pipe mode. Marco Bravo has locked on the carrier. Marco Alpha has also locked on carrier. System based on inside cord. As expected, the DSN has LOS for inside expense. Copy that, thank you. All station, InSight systems on InSight court. DSN has lost the x band signal from InSight, indicated expected cruise stage separation. Standing by for UHF signal acquisition via Marco or Radio Science. We are about five minutes from entry and have confirmation we've lost the x band signal from InSight. This was expected because we have transitioned from the antenna on the cruise stage to the UHF antenna on board the spacecraft. Ground stations have detected the UHF signal and Marco has locked on the signal. This confirms that InSight is transmitting UHF signals as expected. InSight telemetry through the Marco relay is not expected until about two minutes before entry. So, Rob, that was exactly what we were hoping to hear, that yes. the Marcos are The vehicle working. has also performed the turn to entry maneuver. Yes. The vehicle is turning away from a sun-pointing attitude and oriented itself to enter the Martian atmosphere. Uh, this is a big first step. Uh, getting Just getting the, the cruise stage separated, uh, it's now, as after the vehicle turns itself to the right orientation, the cruise stage is now going to be uh, f get further and further away until it's about three or four football fields away and will burn up in parallel as the vehicle enters Mars. And, and Christine mentioned turn to entry. What does that mean? Well, it's because the cruise stage has to be pushed off to one side uh -huh. like this. The rest of the vehicle has to turn to face the atmosphere and to be dead nuts on as it hits hits the uh, the top of the atmosphere. So this is taking all the heat coming into the atmosphere. Exactly. It'll be both provide a source of drag, but also thermal protection because it gets over 1,500 degrees Celsius on the top of the, on this heat shield. Very very hot. Uh, but on the inside of the heat shield, it may be only a, f uh, a fraction of a few degrees above room temperature. So it's a wonderful protective device to keep our lander safe. All right. So the next thing we're standing by for is is entry, entry. hitting through the going to the top of the atmosphere, and gradually slowing down. Right now, the vehicle's just now beginning to. Will be, very soon, we'll be beginning to feel the atmosphere touching it. Actually, entry is above the atmosphere slightly, so it's really not until a few. Uh, half a minute or so before after entry before we start really detecting the fact that that atmosphere is slowing us down. All right, we'll be standing by. Yes, exciting.
entry is scheduled for 1147. The cruise date SEP and the entry times are locked in, correct? They are. They're locked in when we selected the target and aim the vehicle very precisely. That allows us to know exactly when we hit the entry point, which is uh, 35, 55 kilometers from the center of Mars. So we know those times are locked in, but what about all the other events that take place in Reggie EDM? Science reports dropping carrier power at expected. Marco A and Marco B have to train. Just heard, both Marcos have telemetry. They are doing their job. These small CubeSats are relaying ones and zeros uh, with a few seconds lag from from the vehicle up to the up to these two vehicles, and they re forward them back to Earth to the deep space network using X-band antennas. And, and keep in mind, this was all an experiment. We weren't sure that this was going to work, but we had this need that we didn't have live communication right. in this particular mission. Well, we don't really need communications. We don't need their information, except if something went wrong. We would very much like to get the data right now. We have other spacecraft. We are spacecraft. now receiving insight telemetry via the Marco relay. Ah, it's, it's flowing into this space. That means the team now can watch the data flowing onto their screens as if they're commuting directly. This data vehicle. will provide detailed information about the state of the spacecraft throughout EDL. We were on pins and needles waiting for that because we weren't really sure. Uh, this is wonderful news. Uh, this this will allow us to give some, uh, if this continues working uh, all the way to the ground and beyond, uh, we might even see a, a first picture from the surface of Mars. Wouldn't that be great? Very soon. Atmospheric entry on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Here we go. So in a few seconds, the vehicle will start sensing the atmosphere. I said 35, 22 kilometers from the center of Mars. And it's going to start to slow down very, very slowly at first, but then faster and faster and faster till, uh, to, to reaches about 7 Gs. I made that mistake on the video. It's actually 7 <laughs> Gs, not 12. Uh, and so it, it will, it, but we'll still very, very quickly slow down. And, uh, and, and from 15... In approximately one minute, inside is expected to reach its maximum heating rate. Oh, yes. Plasma blackout is possible during peak heating and could cause a temporary dropout of telemetry. This could last for as long as two minutes. Yeah, the, the gas that comes off the heat shield as it's slowing down, it looks like a meteor if you're on Mars watching the streak go by. That brightness of gas does interfere with the radio reception. And so it's possible that uh, Marco will lose that signal while it's going through this very hot entry. But not to be alarmed. Not to be alarmed. It's it's part of the design. We, we, we completely expect it. Radio science reports plasma blackout as expected. Okay. Oh, wow. Ground stations have reported plasma blackout. Still receiving insight telemetry via Marco. Marco Alpha has carrier interruption. Insight should now be experiencing the peak heating rate. Portions of the heat shield may reach nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit as it protects the lander from the heating environment. That's hot. That's Marco Province shows carrier interruption, but still in lock. Inside has passed through peak deceleration. Telemetry shows the spacecraft saw about 8 G. Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo maintain R lock. Radio science reports carrier detected. Yeah. So, several different communications coming in. Inside is now traveling at a velocity of 2,000 meters per second. It seems to have passed this very critical point of peak heating. And peak deceleration. The 
next big step is parachute inflation. And you can see that on our timeline on the bottom of the screen. The next event is parachute deploy. InSight is now traveling at 1,000 meters per second. Oh, very close. Once InSight slows to about 400 meters per second, it will deploy its 12-meter diameter supersonic parachute. The parachute will deploy nominally at about Mach 1.7. Standing by for parachute deploy. Oh. Radio science reports sudden change in Doppler. Ground stations are observing signals consistent with parachute deploy. Marco Alpha, Marco Bravo, maintain lock status. Telemetry shows parachute deployment. Radar powered on. Heat shield separation commanded. This is really good news so far. Uh, I'm on pins and needles. We have radar activation where the radar is beginning to search for the ground. Once the radar locks on the ground and inside is about one kilometer above the surface, the lander will separate from the back shell and begin terminal descent using its 12 descent engines. Altitude convergence, the radar has locked on the ground. Yes. Standing by for lander separation. Carrier interruption on Marco Alpha and Marco Bravo. Lander separation commanded. Altitude 600 meters. Gravity turn, altitude 400 meters. We're getting there. 300 meters. 200 meters, 80 meters, 60 meters, 50 meters, constant velocity, 37 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, 17 meters, standing by for touchdown. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous. Hands with the Marco, with the Marco team Marcos, there. Marcos, Dean, you did great. <laughs> Tim Pryzer, one of the key designers of Lockheed. Sandy Krasner, what, what a great team. What a great team. This is really fabulous. Fantastic news. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lots of fist bumping going on in there. What a relief. We've cut over to the camera over in Times Square. Boy, people are weathering the rain to see this.
They can't come. This is the hardest part. Getting to the surface of Mars is very hard. This thing has a lot more to do, though. Uh, it's with a lot more to, to go on both today and, and the days that follow before the science can begin. But, you know, just getting a vehicle on from Earth to the surface of Mars is no mean feat. Could you talk about that? I mean, just the mere accomplishment here that we're seeing. It, it's you have to understand that this 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 vehicle is very it's very complicated. Um, it uses twelve engines. Each of those engines are pulsed ten times a second, producing these little tiny uh, impulses, almost like little bullets that keep the vehicle going at a constant velocity as it, as it approaches the ground and still going o over five miles an hour. So those legs feel a fair amount of crush. We still don't know the state of the vehicle right now. We need to look to make sure there are no rocks nearby. The solar panels have to, are, will be in just, in just a few, uh, in about five to ten minutes, will begin to open up. They have to wait for the dust to settle because the dust were, was certainly a lot of dust being lifted in the air around the vehicle right now, which is now just settling. So we're standing by after touchdown. It waits um, an, a couple of minutes to give us an X band beep. And so we are standing by for that. It's a communication that comes directly to Earth from InSight. Yes. Um, and, and it goes uh, to, to the Deep Space Network. There's also something that might be happening now if we're very lucky. Uh, InSight might be able to relay uh, a, an image or a parcel image taken just a few a couple of minutes after landing. So I'm, I'm standing by hoping to see that. But if that doesn't happen, we'll certainly get more images later uh, in our Odyssey Pass in well, about five hours. We see Bruce Banner waiting for it. Yeah, they are, they're, they're, they're I, I don't for, know if they see it yet. They're waiting. That's, that's Justin Mackey and Bruce Banner uh, looking carefully at the cameras to see what they might see. Uh, you are waiting for the image to come back. So this is the first image from InSight itself. InSight Correct. is taking a picture with one yes. of its two cameras. Yes. It's probably a, a view of what's directly in front yes. of the spacecraft, right yes. in front of the lander. This is a camera that it would be using to figure out, is this a good space? Exactly. Is it a good place to put down our instruments? So it is going to take an image and send that image to the Marcos. The Marcos, in turn, will relay it back down to Earth. That's correct. They got it. Oh, no. Let's, let's, let's just wait. Let's see what they saw. There it is. Wow, wow. So it's great. I don't see a lot of. Uh, I don't see a lot of. Uh... Let's explain that image. Now this image has a dust cover on top of it. We have so, lost the signal for Marco. You can see potentially a lot of. Uh, so, uh, radio science a lot of debris that might be uh, on the camera. Uh, for UHF. So we don't know what I'm looking Thank at. Thank you, like, everybody on the All right. Yeah. Yay, Marco. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, there it is. You can see a better view. You can see that really is debris. And there is the horizon back there, uh, the bluish sky. Uh, um, that's part of the lander deck on the front left. Um, I can't take out, but it looks like there's not a lot of rocks in the field of view. But those dots, you see, there are very likely to be dust particles on the, on the lens, the dust cover, the dust which cover. will be removed. After, and we'll and get another shot yes. later on. Yes, um, and amazing. a better, clearer view after the dust cutters removed. So, um, it, uh, insights. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 CubeSats relay communications job is done. They're now flying on. They're now taking pictures back of, toward Mars. 
uh, um, hopefully MRO, which flew overhead, might have been lucky enough to capture the descent of this InSight lander on its, under its parachute. Uh, while, was, while, while this was going on, it, MRO was flying overhead, recording the data, uh, um, like a, also monitoring the tra transactions and recording every bit of signal it could. And, but it also had the ability to take a picture. And maybe we'll, like we did with, with uh, both Phoenix and later for Curiosity Rover, we might be able to see the parachute inflated That as well. would be fantastic. We are standing by now for that X-band beep. Yes. Insight phoning home saying, I'm here and I'm okay. System based on inside court, the DSN and x -Band. Radio science reports X band carrier detected. You can ask X band radio science to acquire the X band touchdown. One and a half minutes with inside is normal. Copy that. Thank you. Flawless. Flawless. We've got the beep. We've. Uh, this was perfect case scenario. This is. My book. This is what we really hoped and imagined in our mind's eye, uh, although we spend most of our looking, visualizing all these bad things can happen. <laughs> um, and sometimes things work out in your favor. And we'll look very carefully at the data to see what might have, uh, how well it went. Um, it, it, but it certainly looked like it was a very successful and perfect landing. We'll have to see um, as we get more data, um, how well things go. And it, right, and, and, and as, the, uh, as the vehicle proceeds, the solar panels will be deployed. Hopefully there's no, we're not on a tilt. It doesn't look like we are, but um, from the image, but um, the solar panels will be deployed safely, we hope, and we'll get confirmation of that around five o'clock uh, local time here in, a, in, a, in about four hours, four and a half hours, five hours from now. And, and this is such a difficult feat in that because of the one way light time, there is no way that any of these engineers could possibly control the vehicle. No. It all has to be done in commands and software. It's, we have to train it to do this work on its own. Uh, radio science reports nominal carrier 30 seconds past the first acquisition. So we're all nominal on the surface. So the vehicle is completely nominal, reported nominal. Uh, it is, uh, it's happy. The lander is not complaining. Um, we have a, we had a way to tell us if it was unhappy, uh -huh. uh, and it wasn't. It's not unhappy. It's quite. It's it's uh, it's in a normal mode, uh, and so it's going to chug along for the rest of the rest of the afternoon on Mars and finish the activities. All right. Well, Rob, I know you're anxious to get in and yes. congratulate yes, the am. crew. Thank you so much for Thank sitting you. here Thank and helping so us out it explain EDL. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you go and go congratulate your friends. Thank you. All right. Take care. Loop recording completed at 
All right. As we had promised, we said we'd bring back the administrator to get your take on what was it like to be in that control room. Jim, what was it like? Well, I'll tell you, it was um, it was intense, and and you could feel the emotion. Uh, it was very very quiet when it was time to be quiet, and of course very celebratory with every little new piece of information that was received. Um, it's very different being here than watching it on TV, <laughs> by far, I can tell you that for sure, now that I've experienced both. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, what's, what's amazing is as soon as it was over, I got a call on my cell phone, and it was uh, the phone number was all zeros. And whenever I get a phone call that's all zeros, it's got to be somebody important. <laughs> I answered it, and it was the vice president. Oh, my God. He watched the whole thing. Um, he is absolutely ecstatic about our program. As you're aware, he's the chairman of the National Space Council, um, and he's been, uh, of course, uh, a keen advocate for what we do. Um, and uh, to have him call within seconds of, of mission success is, is tremendous. And just so everybody knows, <laughs> he wants me to say congratulations to everybody here at NASA and all of our international partners and everybody who has... Um, contributed um, to this mission. Uh, what what an amazing day for NASA. It is an amazing accomplishment in that this is something that is happening millions and millions and millions of miles Absolutely. away, and these people are able to do it. Incredible. And w what's fascinating is the whole time I'm watching it, I'm thinking uh, every milestone is something that, it, that happened eight minutes ago because that's yes. the time lag to get a signal from Mars to Earth. Yes. And so it's, it's kind of... Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's exciting, but then you have to step back and realize that this has already occurred in history. Uh, so it, it is it's a unique experience, incredible, and uh, just the the enthusiasm here is incredible. So, what's for the future? Looking ahead, twenty twenty. Well, let's get through December. Uh, <laughs> so, for the, for the rest of De we think about what's happening next. Uh, December third, we're launching American a another American astronaut to the International Space Station. So that's going to be a big achievement, and it's going to be on a on a Russian Soyuz rocket. That the last time we launched a human right. was not successful. That was scary. Um, it was scary. Um, but we we figured out what the problem is. We're moving forward, and now we've got that underway. December third. Um, going forward from there, we're going to get the first science data back from the Parker Solar Probe on December 7th. So that's not too far away either. And then we've got uh, OSIRIS-REx that will be in orbit around Bennu um, shortly after Christmas. So uh, no shortage of exciting things. And then on, on January 1st, um, we're, we're going to fly the New Horizons mission, which for people who are not aware, that's the mission that went to Pluto back in 2014, gave us stunning images and data and information science on, on Pluto. And now that mission is still going strong. It's, it's in the, the, what we call the Kuiper Belt now, which is an asteroid belt well beyond Pluto. And it's going to be taking images of uh, Ultima Thule, which is uh, an object in the Kuiper Belt, Kuiper belt which we, we have never been able to go out there and take images of anything at close range before, and now we're doing it. So y you ask what's happening next. Uh, <laughs> I'm I got, sorry yeah. I asked. <laughs> we, we have, right now at NASA, there is more underway, um, probably than, I don't know how many, how many years past, but it's like, you know, there's a drought, and then all of a sudden there's all these activities all at once. So we're busy. Uh, we're going to be working through the holiday but a lot of amazing discoveries to be made, and we're looking forward to it. It's so funny because our Ask NASA question you basically answered is, does the success of NASA InSight influence the timeline for future manned lunar or Mars missions? Well, certainly everything we learn about Mars at this point is going to help us understand how to do in situ resource utilization. So InSight could actually provide some really good information about whether or not there's liquid water on Mars and maybe even where it is and how to get to it. Um, we strongly believe uh, that there's liquid water, you know, 10 kilometers under the surface of Mars. Um, so the, the, the key is, um, the answer is yes. The more we learn, the more we're able to achieve. Um, and so to get to Mars, yes. But the lunar missions, the, the, you know, the president's first space policy directive is to go to the moon, to go sustainably with international and commercial partners. So when we say sustainably, that means we're going to have reusability built into the system. And we're going we're gonna to test and prove technologies at the moon that ultimately we can replicate at Mars. So we're going to retire risk, prove human physiology at the moon, which is only a three-day journey, which means um, you know, if something goes wrong, you can get home safely. We saw that with Apollo 13. Um, but we need, we need to use the, the moon as a proving ground to accelerate our path to Mars. In the meantime, we're doing missions like InSight to learn as much about Mars as possible. 
Insight is going to help us understand really asteroid impacts as well, you know, because uh, it's it's got a seismometer, which is going to help us know how often is Mars getting impacted with asteroids. And if we're going to send humans there, it'd be important to know if those humans are going to experience <laughs> asteroid impacts. So, and, and that's pretty much our goal is always learn from our missions and build upon those missions. One after another. NASA has a long history of doing just amazing work in building on its past successes and, in fact, its past failures. That's so, true. Um, I, I'll tell you, what an amazing time to be at the helm of this extraordinary agency. Well, we are so glad that you are here Thank to you. share it with us. Well, again, Thanks for a, joining a us. a true pleasure. Thank All you. All right. Me. And I'm sure you need to go in there yes. and celebrate with those folks. But thank you for stepping out for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you All so right. much. Take care. Now, Mars exploration is cool stuff. But if you're not convinced just yet, just talk to the InSight scientists and engineers. No one conveys the excitement more than the people who actually work on the mission. So earlier this year, the outreach team filled up a van and went to 15 California cities. They called it the Insight Roadshow. So we're here in San Francisco at the Exploratorium, and this is part of Insight's Roadshow. Since it's the first interplanetary mission we've ever launched from California, we're actually doing a lot of public engagement activities along California. And we're just talking to the public and talking to them about insight and getting them excited and sort of sharing information that they probably wouldn't get uh, just from a website. We have Mars Globes and Touchables kits. We have replica of the actual launch vehicle that's going to be taking insight to Mars. We have a selfie station with fun props. People can take pictures. Children really, really like Mars. We have a jump station where we invite uh, kids to come in and jump. We have a little seismometer on the floor which measures ground motion. So if students can come and jump next to it, they can actually see their recording on the screen and they make their own quake. I've had people come to me and say, this is the most I've ever understood about a space mission. I'm so happy I came because now I understand what you're doing, I understand why it's important, and I'm really excited. You kind of imagine how it looks, but seeing it in person actually puts it in perspective. She was able to explain a lot of what happens, the cameras, what goes into the ground. It's a great exhibit, you know, both for myself and also for kids that want to learn about Mars. Okay, we want you to meet another Mars veteran here at JPL. Our director, Mike Watkins, you were a mission manager for Curiosity. Absolutely. I think this is the fifth Mars mission I've worked on. First, really? Fifth uh, Mars lander. So uh, maybe we're getting the hang of it finally. <laughs> <laughs> does it ever get better? I mean, does it get old? Uh, it's always the same? No, it doesn't. I mean, I think we're just as nervous every time. Uh, you know, the whole landing sequence, and it's just such a crazy time. And, and you know, we can't do anything. It's this feeling of helplessness, right? Because the spacecraft's on its own. And everything we, you know, we could do, we did a day ago. And uh, so I think you just always have that nervousness. But, uh, you know, we have confidence in the team. We have confidence in the engineers and scientists that they did everything that they could do. And, uh, and you have to put it in their hands. And it's our eighth successful landing. So we learn from this. We learn a little more. We do it better the next time, pretty much. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, ha we have had one failure. We learned from the failures, too. So, um, in fact, uh, in, in, we learned from all the failures from all the missions, even if they're not JPL missions or NASA missions. Uh, each one of them tells you a little something, an extra test you should do, an extra thing you should guard against, uh, you know, in the Mars atmosphere or, or on touchdown. And so we've learned from all of these, and uh, luckily we've been uh, we've, we've recently been very successful. And we're always trying something new. We're always trying to learn something new. We had a situation this time. Odyssey couldn't be in place to give us bent pipe communications, and so Marco came about. Oh, the Marco is just an incredible success story. You know exactly as you said. We, we couldn't have uh, Mars Odyssey do the real time bent pipe. Uh, for the EDL events. We would have had to wait a couple of hours and, and, and have the, the replay from uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, so we, we embarked on this kind of crazy idea to build these two little CubeSats. And, you know, CubeSats are something that high school kids can build these days. But they, they go up and they go around the Earth. They go around the Earth. Right. These are the first interplanetary CubeSats. First time we've ever sent CubeSats outside the, the Earth's orbit. 
and their sole purpose was to do the relay. So they had this very cool X-band planar uh, flat antenna there, um, and they relayed the, the, the UHF signals uh, in real time for us, and it was just amazing. It's built by a lot of early career folks here at JPL with a little bit of adult supervision, but uh, no, they, the, the engineers, they just did a fantastic job on Marco. It exceeded all of our wildest expectations. They worked perfectly. We built two because we thought maybe one will get there. They both got there. They both worked. It's just a great tribute to the whole, the Marco team. You saw them in there. They had their special black shirts. Yes. Uh, just a fantastic thing. And, and not only did it work for this mission, but I think it opens up the door for more small missions like that. You know, we could actually put cameras on them and put other instruments on them. They're much less expensive. So there, there's, I think, a whole, new, a whole new door. We just opened a door to a new class of, of planetary science, uh, thanks to the Marcos. And so, uh, for the CubeSets, they were just made with off-the-shelf parts. So, yeah, you know, some combination of off-the-shelf parts and some new stuff that we did. We had to build a special radio, of course, because it has to talk to the Deep Space Network. Uh, the antennas are a little bit uh, new technology. But a lot of the stuff is pretty pretty standard stuff that, uh, that you could replicate at, at much lower cost. So what do you think in terms of the future that other missions will be carrying their own relays and not having to depend on a bent pipe from a, a orbiter? You know, they might carry relays. They might actually carry scientific instrumentation. You know, they, they, they can do more than just do relay. They can actually take pictures. You know, they, they, could, uh, they could do spectrometry. They could do lots of other stuff that, we, that we, uh, we'd like to do with orbiters. And so there's a chance we could send them to Venus. We could send them to asteroids. We could send them to, to, to Mars. I mean, there's lots of stuff we can do. And I think we're just learning the capability of, of, of what we can miniaturize and what we can put on these CubeSats. But this is a great, you know, a, a great first first effort. Absolutely. Well, we have one question for you. It's a social media question from George K, age nine, from the UK. How long did it take to plan and build this mission, Insight? Well, that's a great question. So I have, I have two answers to that. Okay. Insight itself. Typically, our missions take from the time we start the mission to the time we 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 uh, launch it. It's about four to five years. In the case of Insight, two, two things happened, one to our advantage and one not to our advantage. The first is we had a lot of heritage from a mission called Phoenix. So a lot of the design work had already been done because it was done for this mission Phoenix, even before that for Mars Polar Lander. So a lot of the basic design we kind of inherited for this mission. On the other hand, we had a little bit of bad luck in that the instruments, the seismometer is so unbelievably precise is so incredibly accurate and hard to build that we couldn't quite get it ready. So we're doing that in partnership with the French and a lot of other countries in, in Europe, including the UK and Switzerland and, 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 uh, and other folks. We couldn't quite get that ready to go for launch. So we had to actually wait two years and took an extra two years then because of that. So Mars and the Earth are only lined up to launch about every 26 months. So we had to wait another 26 months. So that took us a little bit longer. Well, speaking of the internationals, that's a perfect segue for where we're going next. Throughout this program, we've been trying to introduce you to the people behind the scenes. And for the InSight mission, it requires that we go beyond our borders. This is truly an international mission. Let me introduce you to Domenico Giardini, a Swiss Italian scientist who studies earthquakes and Marsquakes. Some of us have been in this mission for 20 years. It's a life.